is a, a doctrine, a teaching of the New Testament that we do not focus enough upon. The living presence of God in our lives. O God our Father, you are in me and I am in you. Have you noticed how many times in the New Testament Paul uses that kind of expression, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And the idea, the reality of that goes back to what Jesus spoke about in the upper room on the night before his betrayal and his death. We tried to be very practical this week in providing you with um, reflection upon the story of Jesus and uh, we've drawn attention to some resources such as following Jesus which is a resource that you can use as elders in your church or in your small groups or in your homes walking through the story of Jesus. We've shared with you the ideas out of if you can eat, you can make disciples as we've looked at Jesus' um, practical ministry and how he engaged with people and built a disciple-making movement. We've shared with you, and we'll come back to this tomorrow, we've shared with you the concepts of Discovery Bible Reading and some of you have been using this in your groups, your family groups, your tents, your caravans or your homes each morning as you've worked through the scripture that we've re recommended for the day. And uh, we have also given to you all a little sample of this just wonderful. What did you think of it when you looked at it? You've received this a couple of nights ago. Uh, those of you who are present, um, a printing that includes the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John and the Book of Acts. Just a great sequence of scriptures in this small publication. And I think I mentioned to you that the Division and the Signs have already printed over a quarter of a million copies of these and they will be available to your churches in the coming weeks, not just for you to read yourselves, but these are for you to share with friends, with colleagues, with neighbours, because this is going to be a very simple and easy way to encourage people to actually read this wonderful story, the story of Jesus. The Gospel of Mark, of course, is the, the easiest gospel to read. It's very simple. It's written by John Mark. We believe it's the story of Peter, the Apostle Peter. And so it's got a lot of fishing stories in it. It's a, a really enjoyable read. It's not complicated. doesn't start with a genealogy. doesn't start with theological words and that type of thing only 20 pages long and a very easy way for your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues uh, to actually get into reading this simple story, a book from the time of Jesus. That really surprises people, that there would be a little book that is available uh, 20 pages from 2,000 years ago. And there they don't have to read the story of Jesus mixed with all of the concepts that float around in the media today about Jesus, but they can just read the story itself. And then, of course, go on to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, I don't know whether you recognise, the Gospel of John covers every single fundamental belief of the Christian church. Seventh-day Adventist Church, we hold to 28 fundamentals. Gospel of John covers all of those fundamentals in context of the story of Jesus, except for one. Can you tell me what it is? It doesn't explore the theme of the thousand years or the millennium. You have the two resurrections in the Gospel of John, John chapter 5, but all of the other 28 fundamentals are in the Gospel of John. So when people are at the point where they want to know a little bit about who you are as a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, they can read through the Gospel of John. And there they get the story in its uh, completeness and then of course the gospel of mark the gospel of john along with uh, matthew and luke 
uh, the textbooks on making disciples because we see how Jesus did his ministry and made disciples and developed a movement. Um, the last book in this little publication is the book of Acts. And that's our textbook on church. That's our textbook on planting churches. Uh, Jesus said very little about church. He was about making disciples. Then as he came into the last months of his ministry, he used the word church as recorded by Matthew on two occasions. That was just before six months uh, before his crucifixion. And then he used it again in Matthew chapter 18. Fascinating to look at at how Jesus described church. You read, read those chapters again, Matthew 16, Matthew 18. And from those chapters, try to get an understanding of what church would look like from how Jesus was describing church. Very, very different to what we do as church. Then in the book of Acts, you find the apostles gathering people. That's the word church, ecclesia, to gather. They gathered believers they gathered people. As we saw the other evening, those gatherings were pretty small because where did they meet? Met in homes. There was not a single church building. The oldest church building in the world, and it's still used, is the Church of Nativity in Bethlehem. That's the oldest that's in existence. Well, those of you who are interested in archaeology will know that there are a ruin on the banks of the river Euphrates in Syria, not an easy place to get to today. I've been there many times. And some believe that may have been a house room that was converted into a church building, but that still is from the 4th century. No church buildings before the 4th century, after the time of Jesus. And yet we have so much focus upon church buildings. They didn't exist in New Testament times. It wasn't... It totally changed what church was about. We can talk about that more. And then also today I received uh, some reading guides that your pastors will receive and your elders, Multiplying Disciples, another one on church planting, another one on cultivating movements. So we're trying to provide practical resources that you can use to uh, really engage with Jesus engage with the Holy Spirit, engage as uh, ministers of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. How many ministers of the gospel do we have in this room this evening? Let me see the hands of all of the ministers of the gospel. I'm seeing some more hands being raised. Some more ministers of the gospel. You see, unfortunately, we've used the term minister of the gospel of those we call pastors. How many members do we have here this evening? Let me see. Let's see the hands of members. Right. Members of the body of Jesus. You're a follower of Jesus, regardless of whether you're a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to see those who are members of the body of Jesus Christ. Let me see your hands. Right. Disciples, keep your hands up. Those who are disciples. Now remember, a member is not a disciple, necessarily. A disciple may not be a member. A member is someone who consumes the gospel. A disciple is someone who shares the gospel. A disciple is someone who is growing more and more like Jesus every day in every way. This week we've been talking about knowing Jesus, living for Jesus, and serving Jesus. We've been talking about being a movement as the body of Jesus, a, move, a movement of growing disciples who know, live, and serve Jesus. We have members. How many of you are engaged in Introducing Jesus to another person. How many of you are engaged in making a disciple? Because members make disciples. 
And we've tried to be very practical in our discussion this week, focusing upon Jesus and how he lived and how he shared, looking at how he taught to connect and to make disciples and talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit just as he was anointed by the Holy Spirit for his task of ministry, so the Holy Spirit anoints you for your task of ministry. That takes place at your baptism. If it didn't happen at your baptism, when you were baptised by water, you can share together with your family, your church family or your home family. You can pray together. You can pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for baptism by water is not synonymous with baptism by the Holy Spirit. In the scripture, as we saw last evening, baptism by water and baptism of the Holy Spirit form what we call the one baptism of New Testament times. And they're not to be separated, but some of you have been reading the book of Acts And this evening we're going to focus on the book of Acts and we have this book, Following the Spirit, that walks through the story of Acts very carefully. And you'll see cases there where people were baptised by the water first and then a short time later, through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit baptised them. In other cases, you'll find some people who were baptised by the Holy Spirit and then the apostles said or the disciples said or the believers said, What hinders us to baptise this person with water now that the person has been baptised with the Holy Spirit? For in the New Testament, baptism, the one baptism, is baptism by water and by the Holy Spirit. This evening, we are going to focus upon following the Spirit and we see in following the Spirit, He challenges us. It's a confronting and transformative journey to follow the Holy Spirit. Now, I have really encouraged you to read books of the Bible. I've said a number of times, the best way to read each of the books of the Bible is to read it from chapter 1 and verse 1 through to the end. Have you heard me say that? Is that clear? That's really important, really important. The book of Revelation is such an amazing book. But you won't understand Revelation 12, 13, 14. You won't understand the story of the beast and the mark of the beast if you haven't started at chapter 1. In chapter 1, you read it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And there in chapter 1, you have 18 characteristics, attributes of Jesus that are specified. There's no other chapter in the Bible that says so much about Jesus. Only three verses in Revelation 1 that don't actually mention Jesus directly. It's the revelation of Jesus. And as you continue through, you realise this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And by the time you get to Revelation 13, it's making sense. Otherwise, you can make Revelation say anything and make it really harsh and judgmental. This evening... I want to challenge you, I want to urge you to read through the book of Acts sometime very soon, from beginning to end, in one sitting. I want to challenge you to do that. Now, Mark is easy to do because Mark is only 20 pages long. So that's quite easy to read in one sitting, isn't it? But if you're going to read Acts through, it's a bit longer. Who wrote the most in the New Testament? Luke? Or Paul? Quiz question. Paul, are you sure? Paul wrote a bunch of little books, didn't he? Right? Luke wrote two big books. The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. Who wrote the most? Now I've got some saying Luke because I've kind of tempted you to think that maybe he wrote a little bit more. But those who said Paul are correct by half a page. Half a page, right? So be ready for a fairly long read. 
So you may want to put aside a Sabbath afternoon. You could even do it as it was originally written to do. A group of you could get together and you could choose one who is a good reader and you could read it aloud because in New Testament times, the books of the Bible were always read aloud. They didn't have the idea at that time in the first century of reading quietly, just reading, looking. They didn't do that. They read aloud. So when the Gospel of Luke was received, it was read aloud. And there would have been a number of listeners. When the book of Acts was read, it would have been read aloud. And there would have been a number of people listening. So you could do it that way, if you like. That could give fellowship. You could get a hot drink. You could sit down in front of a fire. No, that's not a good idea. You go to sleep in front of a fire. Um, But read the book of Acts from beginning to end. I challenge you. I urge you. I plead with you. I say to you, if you read the book of Acts from beginning to end in one sitting, you will never be the same person again. It is a transforming, challenging journey. For you will be confronted, you'll be confronted with the story of Jesus, you'll be confronted with the pleading, the ministry, and the activity of the Holy Spirit. In the Gospels, we have the story of Jesus. In the book of Acts, we have the story of the body of Jesus. In the Gospels, we have Jesus making disciples and developing a movement. In the book of Acts, we have the body of Jesus, the church, the disciples, the believers. They are making disciples, developing the movement that Jesus started. In the book of Acts, we have the body of Jesus replicating what Jesus had been doing during his life. It is a powerful and inspiring story, for you see the activity of the Holy Spirit. We encourage you to read Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. These words were spoken by Jesus. The the words that we read here that Jesus spoke were spoken by him after his crucifixion, after his resurrection, but before his ascension. So Luke is writing to his friend Theophilus, who we believe would have been probably a Roman official, and he says, In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day was taken up to heaven. What was his former book called? Luke, that's right. In his former book, the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Have some of you noticed as you read through the Gospel of Luke and you go right through to Luke chapter 24, it just stops. It doesn't really have a conclusion. It just stops. It's just kind of hanging there. In fact, it's a really strange statement at the end of the Gospel of Luke. Really strange statement. I hope I'm challenging you to go and look at that statement and see how really strange it is. But it just stops. There's no real conclusion. Because you see, this second letter is the conclusion or the ongoing story of the Gospels. Because now we're seeing after Jesus' death and ascension to heaven, we're having. So here Luke kind of goes over some of this again. I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. Apostles, the word means those that he had chosen to send, the sent ones. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. I am alive, he was saying. He appeared to many. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. 
And also during that period of 40 days, he went to Galilee where he caught up with the 11 apostles on a mountain, most likely Mount Abel, looking over the western side of Lake Galilee, the Galilee side where the Jewish people live. And he was able to see right around Galantis, the area of Golan Heights today, and across the other side to Decapolis, the area of the 10 Roman cities where he had healed the demoniacs on the other side. You remember he went to the other side? And he healed a demon-possessed man on the other side in the territory of complete paganism, dark territory, dark mountains, a lot of pigs, evil spirits over there. The Jews were on the western side of, of the lake. When Jesus gave the commission, he stood on that mountain and you could see the sweep of his hand as he said, make disciples of all ethnic, every nation, tribe, language and people. That was during those 40 days and then Jesus tracked back to Jerusalem and the disciples and the apostles tracked back to Jerusalem as well. And on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised which you've heard me speak about. We talked about that last night. I love speaking about the Holy Spirit. I went to Finland a few years ago, pastors' meetings. They said, speak, teach us about the Holy Spirit. Youth camp, youth congress, straight after the pastors' meeting, we want the Holy Spirit. Camp meeting, straight away, need to speak about the Holy Spirit. In one week, I preached 44 sermons about the Holy Spirit and didn't repeat myself. I tell you, there is so much about the Holy Spirit in Scripture. I need to tell you a story. A few years ago, 25 years into my ministry, I decided it was time for me to refresh myself and my relationship with God. And so I decided to read through the Scripture from beginning to end, looking for being surprised by the presence, the appearance of the Holy Spirit in the stories of Scripture. Now, I could have made it a lot easier for myself. I could have simply taken a concordance. Um, I could have, and these days, just check up on the computer every reference to the Holy Spirit, gone directly to those references and read. But I decided to start with Genesis and read through the Scripture. And of course, right in the first story, we read about the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. And you don't go too far and, and you're reading more stories about the Holy Spirit. 88 references in 22 of the Old Testament books. And uh, I continued to read. It took me some months as I was reading through the Scripture. I was in Sydney for a church growth conference. Went to that conference, it finished quite late in the evening. So before driving back to Melbourne, I booked into a motel in Hornsby, in Sydney. And uh, by this time, I was through to the Gospel of Luke, reading the story of Luke. And I was up to Luke chapter 11, where the disciples, late in Jesus' ministry, that's interesting, they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, you kind of think that Jesus would have taught his disciples to pray early on, wouldn't you? But this is, this is in the last five months or so of Jesus' ministry. Lord, teach us to pray. And so he taught them. First of all, he gave them a model prayer. We call it our Lord's, the Lord's Prayer, or the Prayer of Our Father. And then he told a fascinating story that people who come from the developing world or the third world or the global south understand, but those of us who live in what is called the global north or the developed world really don't understand the story. He told a story to show that we can approach our God at any time to talk to him about anything, and then he talked about the priority request that we need to come to the Father with. He said, ask, you'll receive. Seek, 
You'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And as I was reading through the scriptures, searching for every reference to the Holy Spirit, I was also reading um, comments, insights from the writings of Ellen White in reference to the story of the Holy Spirit. Because our pioneers said much about the Holy Spirit. Our pioneers spoke often about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White says that daily Jesus received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. She said that we, ministers, and we're all ministers of the gospel. If we're disciple makers, we're ministers of the gospel. She says, do not leave your homes until you've received a fresh anointing from God and you know that you've received a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. She uses the term baptism of the Holy Spirit there, which was common in her day, although most commentators would say the better term to use would be a refreshing or an anointing of the Holy Spirit. But she used the term that was common in her day in the evangelical world, the idea of a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit each day. And she actually says concerning this passage in Luke chapter 11, Take your Bibles, declare your faith in this promise, claim the promise, and the Holy Spirit will come. And that evening in a motel room in Hornsby, I was reading, then I watched some sport on television, then I came back to reading, and I was at Luke 11. It was about midnight. And I took my Bible, I knelt down, I lay my hand upon that promise, which is something that I don't usually do. It's kind of not me. And I said, Father, I'm claiming this promise. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock, and the door will be opened. And what was Jesus speaking about? He was not saying, ask for a new car. He was not saying, seek to find the keys to my car. He was not saying, knock on heaven's door door and ask for a parking lot because I'm busy and others need to be pushed out of the way. That's not what he was talking about. Ask, seek, knock, and the door will be open for your Father in heaven is more ready to give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask than any earthly father is ready to give a good gift to his children. You see, this ask, seek, knock invitation is focused upon the priority gift that we could receive, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when he floods our lives. He brings every other blessing in his train. And as I knelt in that motel room and prayed that prayer, claimed that promise, by faith, the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit filled the room with a warmth, with a presence, with a light. That is how he came that day. He's not always going to come in that way. Sometimes he comes with a sense of peace. Read the New Testament. Sometimes he produces feelings and a sense of presence, a sense of warmth, a sense of assurance, a sense of peace will flood your soul. Sometimes You just know that you can trust him and you put your faith in him. Those who are baptized by water and then we pause after that baptism and we kneel and we place our hands upon those people who have just testified to their faith in Jesus and we pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit will always testify to a flood of peace or a flood of assurance or a flood of the sense that God is present and God is real. It doesn't always have to be by feeling. Sometimes you have a bad breakfast, you're not going to feel good at whatever happens. So you claim by faith. 
and you know that the Holy Spirit is present. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, we just want to emphasize the fact. Jesus died once and rose once for our salvation. He did everything that was necessary by his death on the cross and his resurrection for our salvation. We talked about that the other evening. We are justified through faith in Jesus who paid the redemption price, the sacrifice of atonement, and he rose victorious over sin and over death. And so you can stand secure. Have you found that brings joy in your heart to know that you are right with God? You can trust him because of what he has done for you. You are secure in God's presence. Forty days later, the Holy Spirit came. Now, we see here that the believers, after Jesus had given this instruction and he ascended to heaven, they went back into Jerusalem and returned to Jerusalem. They returned to an upper room where they were staying. And there was a bunch of them present, the apostles, and they were joined together constantly. They joined together constantly in prayer with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So they got together. Jesus said, Wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the gift that my father has promised. In a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of course, they were still asking, Lord, are you at this time going to, going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, that's a very Adventist question, isn't it? That's a very Adventist question. Is it now? Is it going to be this year? When is it going to be? And Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. It's not for you to try to work out whether Jesus is going to come in 2020, 2021, 2015, it is not for you to try to work out a scenario of when Jesus might come. It is not for you. This is in the Father's hands. It is not for us to focus upon stargazing and all kinds of things. We're to focus on the task that Jesus has given us. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. We have a job to do. And our job is not to try to work out when Jesus is going to come. That's not our job. Our job is to witness. Sometimes we're so busy working out theories as to when we think Jesus might come that we don't even talk to our neighbours. We don't even talk to our family. We don't even talk to our colleagues on the path of life about Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come. The believers went back into Jerusalem. They waited, they prayed, they did some reorganization. They said, we need to choose somebody with us who is a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit has been here since that time. Holy Spirit did not come that day to then leave. Peter spoke of that day as the fulfillment of the latter early rain and latter rain prophecies of Joel. You read the prophecies of Joel, read them again in Acts chapter 2, and you see that day was a big day, and the Holy Spirit has been here since. And Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, the last verse of that passage that we suggested you read this morning, in that verse, you actually have a summary, have you noticed, of the book of Acts. The first seven chapters are about their witness in Jerusalem and Judea. Then chapter 8, their witness in Samaria. Then from chapter 9 on, the witness of the church to the ends of the earth. And that's where, where we are. We're in the ends of the earth. So we can learn from these stories and see how the early believers responded to the 
uh, commission of Jesus. And it's really interesting to look at the book of Acts and to, and to look at the factors that produce the vitality of the early church. Isn't this an exciting read, the book of Acts? It's a really exciting read. Day of Pentecost. How many were baptized on that day? But it's not just the numbers who are baptized. 3,000 baptized and others added daily to the fellowship of believers. It's not just the numbers who are baptized. What is exciting as you read through the book of Acts is the spiritual vitality of the people. What is encouraging is the, is the life and the commitment to Jesus that you read of. Now, as you go through the book of Acts, certain factors really stand out in this story. Number one, they knew how to pray. And along with that, they knew clearly what their message was. They understood clearly what their message was. What was their message? Their message was, Jesus is alive. On the day of Pentecost, what was Peter's message on the day of Pentecost? As he explained the wonders of God that the people were hearing, he said, you know what this is about? The one that you crucified, the one who was accredited to you by miracles from God, the one that you crucified, he is now alive. You put him to death on the cross, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, and he is now at the right hand of the Father. So what was the message? Jesus died for you. Jesus is alive now. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Conviction came upon them. The other evening, we talked about Jesus. We talked through the story of Jesus. And as we talked through the story of Jesus in sequence, we just quickly kind of just chatted through the story of Jesus just a couple of nights ago. And as we did that, I, I observed, I noticed. Did you notice there was kind of a, a hush? There was a quietness that settled here in this tent as we just talked through the story of Jesus. And it reminded me of standing on the stage in the Michael Fowler Centre in Wellington. And when I presented with the diplomats of Israel present, presented on the story of Israel and talked about um, Judaism and Islam and then told the story of Jesus. The same quietness that moved in this tent the other night came into the Michael Fowler Center. The Spirit of God was touching the hearts of people and people were convicted as they heard the story of Jesus. Those early believers, they knew what their message was. They knew what it was to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you find as you continue through the book of Acts, they often pause, like in Acts chapter 4, and they sought a refreshing anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon them and made them bold in talking about Jesus. They knew that every single believer was a minister. Day of Pentecost, 3,000 baptized. It wasn't a mass baptism. Have you stopped and thought about that? It wasn't a mass baptism. You could only have 100 or 150 crowded in the street at the time. But Peter said, this is for you and your children and all of those who are far off. Repent of your sins. You'll receive forgiveness. You'll receive the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. And they ran home. And there would have been baptisms in Mikvah all across the city. Families here and families there. The apostles were not doing the baptizing. It was happening all across the city. 3,000 by the end of the day 
The priesthood of all believers was instituted right at that spot. And where were they gathering and sharing the Lord's Supper and sharing the apostles' story and, and their vision? They were meeting in homes and discussing the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures and the application to the story of Jesus. And faith was right there on the path of life. That's what Jesus had commissioned. He had said, go and make disciples of all ethnic, right on the path of life. And as you make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit in every relational stream. And these, these grey bands represent these relational streams or these ethnic that we're all part of. And then when we look at the book of Acts and we see the models of sharing faith and the models of gathering, first missionary journey, they followed relational streams. Why'd they go to Cyprus? Paul had already been to his home territory. Barnabas would have said, hey, nobody's been to Cyprus. Let's go to Cyprus. So they follow relational streams. They get through to Paphos. Sergius Paulus, the king, becomes a believer. And they leave immediately, say, that's a really strange story. Why did they then head up into central Anatolia, up into Galatia? Archaeology tells us that's exactly where Sergius Paulus came from. So they're tracking the relational stream of his family. Then we look at the second missionary journey, and they planted church into the ecos, which was the household, the household of Lydia, the household of the jailer, the household of Jason, the household of Aquila and Priscilla, the household of all of those six in Corinth. The gatherings of believers in homes. And then the third missionary journey. Here are they following relational streams. They're doing exactly what Jesus did. Fostering faith on the path of life. Paul comes to Ephesus. He sits in one place. He equips people as they come to Ephesus. Brings them to Jesus. Equips them. And they go home. And they plant the church in Smyrna. And Pergamum. And Thyatira and Sardis, and Philadelphia. Heard of those cities? And Laodicea. And Paul never put his foot inside those cities. What was he doing? He was equipping the believers. And out in the Lycus River Valley, where you have the city of Laodicea, and a church was planted there, also just across the valley was Heriapolis, and across the valley was Colossae, and the home of Nympha, and the home of Achippus. Who were planting these churches? The priesthood of all believers. They didn't need money because they simply led their neighbours and their friends to Jesus and they had gatherings in their homes and they led people to Jesus there right on the path of life. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you'll be my witnesses, Jesus said, to the ends of the earth. What a privilege. What a privilege we have to engage with our neighbours, our family, our friends. Introduce Jesus to them. Lead them to Jesus. That's why we've tried to share with you really simple ways of looking at Scripture. You don't have to know anything. You just say, let's keep reading. And the Holy Spirit empowers you. Some of you are doing this. Some of you have shared with me. Father, I pray for your blessing upon us and help us to glorify your holy name. As Holy Spirit, you work through us in us to uplift Jesus, in his name. Amen.